Good morning. It's good to see the, the faithful crowd here on this Sunday after Christmas. Uh, we had some great Christmas Eve and Christmas Day services here, so uh, it's good to be back in worship again for the third day. So, a uh, so couple of announcements are the poinsettias that have brightened up the sanctuary uh, can be picked up whenever, just as long as you leave these gold, these, uh, gold pots behind. We would appreciate that. There's a confirmation retreat coming up for our confirmation students and a couple of staff on the 16th and 17th. Other than that, it's, it's kind of getting back to business as usual this week with the 50 plus potluck on Wednesday and some Bible studies. No women's Bible study, but men's Bible study will resume on Thursday. The radio and online services are given by Woody and Diane Keat. And I'll invite you to rise for the opening prayer as you're able. Shine into our hearts the light of your wisdom, O God, and open our minds to the knowledge of your word, that in all things we may think and act according to your goodwill and may live continually in the light of your Son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Peace of the Lord be with you. Share a sign of peace with your neighbor as we prepare to sing the opening hymn.
Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the maker of heaven and earth, the Word made flesh, the Lord and giver of life. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and one another. God of glory, God of peace, we confess that we have shunned the light that reveals the truth about us. We cling to worldly things rather than sharing the gifts of this earth. We trust ourselves above all. Save your people, O God. Sustain the rivers and trees that sing your praise and free us to live boldly in the light and truth of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. The grace of God shines upon us, bringing salvation to the whole world. We are saved. Our sins are washed away. Not because of anything we have done, but according to God's mercy in Jesus Christ. Renewed by the Holy Spirit, let us live in hope and joy. may be seated for the readings. Our lector this morning is Kurt Johnsrud. The first lesson is from Samuel, the second chapter. Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy wearing a linen ephod. His mother used to make for him a little robe and take it to him each year once she went up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. When Eli would, would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, May the Lord repay you with children by this woman for the gift that she made to the Lord. And then they would return to their home. Now the boy Samuel continued to grow both in stature and in favor with the Lord 
and with the people. This is the word of the Lord. We'll read Psalm 148 responsibly. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Then let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. Praise the Lord from the earth, you sea monsters and all deeps. Fire and hail, snow and frost, stormy wind fulfilling his command. Mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars. Kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His glory is above earth and heaven. The word of the Lord. The second lesson is from Colossians, the third chapter. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in the one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom, and with gratitude in your hearts, sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This is the word of the Lord. We'll now thank Hark the Herald Angels Sing, number 270.
And if you're able, I invite you to stand uh, with me as we uh, read our Holy Gospel for this first Sunday after Christmas, a reading from the second chapter of St. Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. Now every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover, and when he was 12 years old, they went up as usual for the festival. And when the festival was ended and they started to return, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents did not know it. Assuming that he was in the group of travelers, they went a day's journey. Then they started to look for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. And after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Child, why have you treated us like this? Look, your father and I have been searching for you in great anxiety. And he said to them, Why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he said to them. And then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. His mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in years and in divine and human favor. The Gospel of the Lord. And you may be seated. 
I know you got your hopes up. There wasn't a sermon printed in the bulletin, uh, but I'm here to disappoint you, of course. Uh, Merry Christmas uh, to each and every one of you, and happy, happy New Year. Um, I think that time flies by, and the next time we gather together, it'll be next year. So we'll see you next year on Sunday. I think the uh, gospel uh, text is kind of indicative, though, how time flies. Uh, uh, Jesus was just born yesterday, and now we have him grown, right? He's, uh, he's 12 years old in just a day, at least according to our uh, uh, Bible. I've got to get to a location here where I can see my notes. That's why I'm creeping up. Virgil, you stay awake. Uh, I'll do that later. Well, um, the New Testament, of course, uh, see, when you sit in the back of the church, this is what happens. If you guys would just sit up front, then I wouldn't have to be moving all around. In the New Testament, though, and many of you, I think, already know this, there's only one story of Jesus as a child uh, from the time he was born. Uh, uh, there's only one story in between the time he was born until he was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. And that's the story that we have uh, before us uh, uh, today when uh, Mary and Joseph uh, took uh, Jesus uh, to celebrate uh, the, the Passover. Uh, and, um, and then uh, uh, it's uh, this profound story of what happened when Jesus uh, was not where his parents expected him to be, right? That's the, that's the uh, jicks of this uh, story. So it contains a lot of elements of the stories we know when we think about um, when we consider uh, lost children, really. Um, Mary and Joseph took Jesus uh, with uh, them to Jerusalem, and uh, after it was over, the people from the community of Nazareth started for home, right? Uh, but a day uh, into this uh, return trip, Mary and Joseph discovered to their horror that their child... Jesus was not with the group. He wasn't there. He wasn't there uh, with them. He was missing. A and the text tells us that they assumed he was in the group of travelers with a family and, and with friends. And we know that life was very communal in Jesus' day. And we know it was common for the whole village to raise their children and then uh, to travel together when they traveled as a community. So they wouldn't go just as a family, but they would go together as a whole community. It would be like if all the people from Dawson decided to celebrate Christmas in the cities, and we would all travel uh, together. Stop in Hutchinson for a cup of coffee at Burger King, you know, and then, and then head, head up to the cities. Um, um, so it was a, a communal. Life was very communal in Jesus' days. Um, uh, when I think about this story, when I read this story uh, in seminary, I couldn't understand this passage because I, I really uh, couldn't understand how you could uh, lose a child, how you could lose a 12-year-old child and not be aware of it, right? How many days did they look for him? For three days, right? And that was, uh, that, it was a whole day until they realized that he was gone, right? So four days had gone by. Um, so I didn't quite understand this when we would study this text at, at the seminary, um, how you could lose a 12-year-old kid. Um, but then when I became a parent uh, of a 12-year-old, it made sense to me. Uh, and even makes a sense to me how, uh, at least on some days, you would want your 12-year-old child. No offense to 12-year-old children in, in this room, um, but it does make sense to me how you would even want to lose your child for maybe three or four days, right? Uh, um, uh, but here, here we have this interesting story of, of, of Jesus and uh, Jesus seemingly uh, getting, getting lost. Um, uh, so... Uh, I think that Joseph and Mary, Jesus' parents, um, had even been working maybe on teaching maybe Jesus some responsibility, right? So maybe they let him be alone. Uh, you know, maybe they weren't watching over him constantly because that's what parents do, right? They teach their children how to be responsible, 
responsible. So they were teaching this responsibility thing with, with him. But in spite of all this, uh, he didn't join the group uh, when they all left for home. So um, uh, I, they lost Jesus, and I think, uh, frankly, I take great comfort in knowing that even a holy family had at least one bad vacation, right? They, they had one bad vacation. And so what follows uh, is this Mary and Joseph discover that they uh, have lost Jesus, and it's a, it's a fascinating journey, uh, not just following the story, but it's a fascinating journey of emotion. So that's what I want you to think this morning about this journey of emotions that's found in this, this story. Uh, first, not surprisingly, came the emotion of anxiety, right? Uh, came the emotion of uh, maybe even panic. Um, few things frighten a parent more than a lost child. So after checking around, they discovered that Jesus never began the trip home. He never started the trip home, which meant he was still in Jerusalem. And he was alone in Jerusalem, that holy, that holy city. Um, and after checking around, they discovered, uh, you know, that that big city had a lot of places that a boy could really get lost in, and maybe even a young boy could get in trouble in. So, um, so for three days, uh, for three terrifying days, right, Mary and Joseph are filled with fear. So that's the first emotion that we get in, in this story. After fear then, the next uh, emotion that we get is maybe we would say astonishment. Astonishment. Uh, when they finally discovered him alive and well, he was in the temple, right? He was in church. And who would expect to find a 12-year-old kid in church right after the holidays? Why do I keep looking over at you? <laughs> All right. Uh, but here he was, this 12-year-old uh, in church, and he's uh, talking to the pastors. He's talking to the clergy. Who would expect that? So the fear, the, the emotion of astonishment, right? Jesus is talking theology. That's pretty astonishing. But something snapped in Mary. Some parent chromosome kicked in as astonishment uh, immediately gave way to the next emotion, and the next emotion was anger. Uh, just listen to her words. Mary said, child, uh, notice she's not taking this 12-year-old man too seriously. She calls him a child, right? Uh, she calls him a child. And, he, and she says, why have you treated us like this? Look, your father and I have been searching for you in great anxiety. It was as if to say, Jesus, why aren't you where you're supposed to be? Why aren't you where you're supposed to be? So there is this emotional journey from fear to astonishment and then, and then to, to anger. And I think it's a journey that many of us have taken with Jesus when we think about Jesus. This journey is a familiar journey because many of us go on this journey of fear to astonishment to anger. Uh, having just passed through Christmas and having just told ourselves the great news once again that the Savior is now with us, we then set out on the road back to normal. I mean, we start to think about taking down our holiday Christmas decorations, right? Even our tree over here decided that uh, we're done with the Christmas lights on the tree in the narthex. Half of them were out when we came in this, this morning. So we start thinking about tucking things away for another year. And so like Mary and Joseph, we assume that Jesus is near to us and will be near to us, and it would be frightening to, to, to discover that he's not as near as we thought he was. And it is really frightening when you cannot find Jesus in the place where you think Jesus is supposed to be. That can be really frightening. But according to the text, Jesus is often not in the place that we expect him to be, and maybe not even in the places where we think Jesus should be. To tell the truth, that's enough to make you angry. So we echo Mary's lament. Jesus, why have you treated us like this? We've been looking all over for you. And the response of Jesus, the response of the Savior is striking. This is what Jesus says. Why were you searching for me? 
Why were you searching for me, Jesus asks his mom and dad. Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? Or as an older translation says, that I must be about my father's business. Did you not know that I am about my father's business? Why should you have to search for me? Jesus wants to know. Did you not know that my mission is the business of God? That's the mission that I am about. So Jesus is not an ambulance driver who comes whenever we beckon him to come to us. Jesus is not a magician or a fix-it man. He has no political affiliation. And thankfully, he's not a lobbyist for our causes that we bring before him. He doesn't even protect us from accidents or tragedy. Jesus Christ is in the mission of God on earth, and that mission is salvation. Salvation is Jesus' mission. It's the mission of God, and Jesus conducts this mission his way, not our way, not your way, not my way. And it's important to note that Mary and Joseph lost Jesus. But Jesus himself was never lost. Jesus was never lost. Jesus knew just where he was all the time, and he knew what he was doing. Even more, he knew who he was, as he told his parents when they were anxious about him, even angry at him. And it seems to me that this is true wisdom, to know who you are, to really know who you are, and to know where you belong. When you know those two things, then you're never lost. Never lost. How many times do we lose sight of who we are or who we belong to? We do that often. We lose sight of our true purpose in life. How many times do we get lost, and by lost I mean lose sight of our true relationship with God and with his Son, Jesus Christ? But Jesus is never lost. Jesus is never lost. And when we cling to him and to our true identity with him, everything else falls into place in life. And this is the beginning of wisdom for us, I believe. So with all the emotions given in the story of Jesus' childhood, there is one final response by Mary to all of this. Remember, we've moved from anxiety, panic, fear, anger, and then astonishment, but there's one more emotion as well. Mary uh, did not stay angry at Jesus. If you remember these words at the end of the story for today, we are told that she treasured all these things and pondered them in her heart. We remember hearing those words earlier, don't we? When Jesus was born, she treasured all these things and pondered them in her heart. It was the same response she made to the story of the shepherds when Jesus was born. There would be a lot of that for Mary in the years ahead, a lot of pondering, a lot of treasuring, And it would culminate when she found her son on a cross, another place that Mary did not expect to find her son. But that was where the business of God was being done, on the cross. That's the way salvation is accomplished. Salvation is accomplished never as we expect it. So you don't have to understand the work of Christ. You don't even have to see the work of Christ all the time. You just have to join Mary. You just have to be like Mary. You just have to take it in, ponder it, treasure it in your heart. Amen.
please rise as you are able, as we confess together the Apostles' Creed and the story that we treasure in our hearts. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Part of our offerings this morning, we bring prayers before God, so let us pray. Gracious God, you have blessed us with more than we could ever give you thanks and praise for. Forgive us for taking even the smallest things for granted, and grant us the courage to turn from desiring what others have that we do not. Let gratitude be always before us, revealing your loving goodness. Lord, in your mercy. God, in times of trouble, we pray for the continual work of recovery in areas affected by the recent tornadoes. Be with those affected in the grief of a first Christmas without all that was lost. And stir in the hearts of your people near and far to give whatever they can to bring healing and restoration. Lord, in your mercy. Baby Lord Jesus, let us not forget the miracle of Christmas in the weeks to come. Let us keep before us your humble vulnerability to come into the world and dwell among us. May your presence transform us more and more into your image. Lord, in your mercy. We give you these prayers, God, and trust in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We sing our offertory hymn, the first no Noel, number 300.
Our Lord's Prayer this morning will be sung to the tune of Away in a Manger. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace, serve the Lord. <laughs> 